Well, about 20 years ago, uh, I was a young adults pastor uh, at a church uh, in the uh, uh, metro Detroit area. And it was a phenomenal church, 15 different campuses, doing incredible things for God. I was, I was the young adults pastor, so I had about 300 uh, 18 to 23-year-olds that I uh, got to minister to and lead in, in worship services. And it was, in some ways, a church in and of itself of just young people and some of the most fun times that Becky and I have ever had. And uh, I was part of the teaching team as well. And, and it's a, um, a neat ministry. And we used to take uh, missions trips every summer. And one summer, we took our young adults to uh, Fraserburg, South Africa. And uh, we went into Cape Town, uh, South Africa, which is absolutely stunning. One of my favorite places to go. We went in there, did a few things for a couple days, but then spent an entire week up in Fraserburg, which was north of Cape Town, uh, quite a bit in a small village, really only 300 people in the town. Um, We really weren't prepared that well. We were doing a vacation Bible school, so we were going to spend a week uh, ministering to to children. And we really weren't prepared for the fact that this was, in many ways, a town handed over to Satan. There were only, at that time anyways, there were only two... Uh, quote-unquote Christian churches. In one of the churches, the pastor was involved in multiple affairs that everybody in the village knew about. And the other church, the pastor just kind of packed it in, and really they weren't doing anything. They existed, but they weren't doing anything. In this town, alcoholism, it was just rampant. I remember on that Friday, payday, Hundreds of people lined up at the liquor store, got their check, went to the liquor store, waiting to get in to get their liquor for the weekend. There were many, not just a few, many kids who had, uh, what do you call it, alcohol, um, feed, what is it, fetal, fetal alcohol, so, you know, you could tell with the eyes, many of them found out that many of the kids would run into the woods, so there was a wooded area. Many of the kids would run into the woods all weekend. When I asked why, they said because their dads and their grandpas and their uncles would drink and then would sexually abuse them, boys and girls. I have been many... (laughs) Many on many adventures in 31 years of pastoral ministry. I've been in some dark places, but I don't think I'd been anywhere that dark. Our first night there was going in to go to sleep, our first night there, and I started having trouble breathing. I felt this heaviness where I couldn't breathe. I felt like someone was pressing really hard on me, and I was hard time breathing. I was choking. And this didn't make sense because at the time, unlike today, at the time, I was in great shape. I was very skinny. I was at my college weight. I was doing uh, triathlons. I was in good shape. You know, (laughs) now that happens, and I'm just, you know, out of shape. But... uh, (laughs) I was like, what is happening? I'm dying. I I thought I was having maybe a heart attack. And then all of a sudden, all of these these thoughts, these negative thoughts entered into my mind. What are we even doing here? This this is probably more about us than than even them. Look how horrible it is. There's nothing we, what are we going to do? There's nothing we can do. Why am I even a pastor? Like, I've never doubted God's call. And all of a sudden, all of these, well, (laughs) finally clicked. I'm being attacked in a very heavy and significant way. I've been attacked (laughs) in ministry and felt demonic even uh, attacks. But nothing that like physically (laughs) I felt pressing against me. When I finally figured that out, a 
pulled out my Bible and began to read the word. <laughs> and I sang some songs of worship. I put my headphones in and just sang to the Lord and sang to the Lord. And it, and it drifted away and I fell asleep in peace. And we woke up the next day and I said, we're not doing anything until we do a prayer walk on every street of this village. And so the young adults and myself, we went and we did a prayer walk and we prayed over every street and every house in this village. We did the VVS and over 100 kids gave their life to Jesus Christ. And so praise God for that. The reason why I bring that up is because I'm telling you from experience, demonic attacks are real. Now, in the scriptures, especially in the gospels and in the book of Acts, in those early books, you could say the gospels are, is really the history of Jesus and Acts is really the history of Jesus' church. You see quite a bit of this demonic possession and influence and casting out demons. And, and I've been asked this before. It, it doesn't seem like we see a lot of that today. Don't, don't seem to, to, to experience a lot of it, at least to that degree. It seems like there's certain maybe pockets of the world where there seems to be more of that than in other areas. And so there's a lot of questions that come up. This idea of, of demons and Satan and, and spiritual warfare. And I won't pretend to be able to answer all of those questions in our time together this morning. But in the passage that we're looking at, um, Mark chapter 3, if you want to turn there. In Mark chapter 3, we, we see this confrontation and it's not the only time we see it. We see it throughout the gospel between Jesus and demons. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn as it relates to angels, demons, and spiritual warfare from this passage of Scripture. Now, what we're gonna, I'm going to try to do, and, and it may not happen, so don't hold me to it. I'm going to try to end the sermon time, pray, and then it opened up for some Q&A. It always makes me nervous when we just hand a mic to somebody. <laughs> but if we have time, we're going to try something a little bit different. Now, we, we'll do testimonies and things like that from time to time. But we're going to actually, if we have time, um, try to field a couple questions. We'll see how we do on that. If not, we'll come back to it another time. But it's important for us to find balance. I, I find that this is an area where there can be extremes. And C.S. Lewis, a wonderful book, The Screw Tape Letters, is, is an incredible book on angels and demons. And so I would encourage that to, for anyone. But I want to quote from that book for just a moment. He said the following, There are two equal and opposite heirs into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So those are kind of the extremes, right? Where, where it's like, we're, we're not even thinking, we're so you know, focused on here and now and, and not even thinking about spiritual warfare, even though we're told to in Scripture to be thinking and understanding these things, that we don't, we're not even thinking on that level at all. And then the other extreme is where we see Satan behind every single bush. You know, the, 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 your alternator goes out, like mine did last week, and we're casting out the spirit of the alternator. You know, like, you know, I mean... <laughs> You know, where there's extremes to that. And I think we all get kind of, kind of more of those extremes. And so I just want you to know where I land. I land somewhere in the middle where, where I think that we need to be aware, we need to understand, but also not to be so obsessed with it, all right, that, that it begins to 
impact and change us into the negative. And so hopefully my goal today is that we'll do that. Now, before we jump into Mark 3, let me just read two passages of Scripture that I think are, are important as we set up this conversation together, okay? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Uh, it says, be sober-minded. In other words, this is serious stuff. Take this serious Right? Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Okay? If, we, if it ended there, that would be kind of a scary verse. Right? But it doesn't. It says, resist him firm in your faith. Satan does not have to have authority over our lives. Praise God. Right? And by the way, there's only one Satan, right? There's only one. But there are millions upon millions upon millions of fallen angels that serve in his wicked army. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, this is fairly a popular passage of scripture for many. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Whether we realize it or not, there is a cosmic war going on in our marriages, in our homes, in our workplaces, in this church, all around us that we don't see. And there are a few occasions in Scripture where God chooses in his holy word to peel back and allow us to see a glimpse of that. One of that was with Elisha in, I believe, 2 Kings, where there are fearful people because they're surrounded by, by, the, by their enemies, and God allows the servant of Elisha, allows him to see this, this, this fiery, angelic, army of angels, good angels, that are surrounding and more numerous than the literal human army. And I want to tell you, I don't know if that's normative, but I really like that village, uh, that vision. Amen. To know that that's, that's reality, whatever that looks like for us, this church. That, and we get these moments. We, we get it in Daniel chapter 10 where, where, where Daniel is praying and confessing on behalf of the people and, and Michael comes to him, the angel Michael comes to him, says that he had been detained because of the prince of Persia, not a human, but an angel who were fighting. Now you may ask, what does fighting look like? Here's my answer. I don't know. So don't ask it later if we do a Q&A because I'll say, I don't know. But somehow there's this battle happening, and so he was detained, but he eventually shows up and delivers God's answer to Daniel. And so we have these moments where it's peeled back, and we realize there's angelic fighting going on. And it involves God's glory, God's people. And it's important for us to remember that. And that's why Paul would go on to say, therefore put on the armor of God. Armor up, people! <laughs> We're in a battle, an unseen one and one that we see in front of us. So armor up. So I'm going to kind of read that and, and, and tell you these two things, and then we're going to actually dive in to Mark 3. <laughs> two don'ts, two don'ts I want to give you of spiritual warfare. Number one, don't be unaware. And number two, don't be afraid. So before we dive in, I want to make sure you understand this is kind of the take home, really. I'm giving it to you up front, okay? I want us to leave here, right, not being unaware. I want us to leave here aware and more conscious and more intentional moving forward about this warfare that's happening. Because don't think for a moment that there aren't demonic influences wanting to take down Church on the Rock. Do not think that. I have seen it in previous churches. I have seen the attacks of the evil one. I'm telling you, it is real. You could take a church like Mars Hill out in Seattle. Over 15,000 people, I think, at one time. I think, don't quote me. Mark Driscoll, the pastor, had this huge ministry, especially among young people. Boom, wiped out like that. Church no longer exists today. 
Don't think that there aren't demonic influences that can destroy a church. And humans are the weapons they use to do it. So this is a fun time as a church. We're only two years old and, and, and we're in a new facility and we're able to now get you know, uh, 400 plus people in here and we've been growing and our giving's good. And, and, and this, is, you know, this is kind of a fun time as a young church. Do not be unaware that demons want to take this church down. So we have to be on guard. We have to fight the good fight. We have to be prayer warriors as a church. And we have to get along with one another because he loves to use dissension to break up a church. Now, I haven't heard of any dissension. This isn't like one of those like passive aggressive pastor moments, you know, you know, or where you throw in a jab during your sermon, you know, not, okay, I don't know, but I, but I know it happens and I know it can happen anywhere. So we, we must leave here aware that we have to be on our guard as a church. And number two, but also leave here not afraid. There's nothing to fear. If we're walking with Christ, if we're not dipping into the occult, if we're not, if we're not leaning into evil things, but we are, are, are as imperfect beings, though walking with Christ, right? We're walking with Christ. There is nothing to be afraid of. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. world. So I want us to leave here more aware and unafraid. Amen? Amen. That's the goal today. All right, Mark chapter 3. How's that for a really long introduction? All right. Mark chapter 3. We'll pick it up at verse 7. If you're new with us, by the way, we're going through the book of Mark, and we're taking our time. We're marinating the soul in the book of Mark because this is a book about what it really means to follow after Jesus, and that's what we want to be as a church. And so we're taking our time. I think we're like on week 9, and we're only in chapter 3. So we are really taking our time, all right? But we are up to verses uh, 7. Starting in verse 7, look at verses 7 through 11. It says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed him from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and uh, uh, Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him, for he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Now, this is the part we're going to focus in on. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now, there's a lot we have to leave on the table for the sake of time. There's there's debate about evil spirits. Is this the same thing as a demon? Is this a different type of, you know, angelic being or or some else? There's a lot of things we could go further in. Let me remind you, in the fall... And we'll be talking more about this. We are starting the Rock Bible Institute. We will be taking courses that you can take that will give you more deeper theology and teaching that you can be a part of. And the very first Bible course, we always offer to it, to it at the same time, a Bible course and a ministry course is how it's going to be. And when we start this in August, the first Bible course is the Doctrines of the Faith. And so there will be a week in that course where we'll dive a little deeper on the things that I'm talking about today and uh, look at different things as it relates to the angelic world, okay? Call that uh, angelology or demonology, and we'll look more at that then. So there's some I won't share uh, today, but I want to give you some basic things that I I hope will encourage us today. Here's the first thing I want us to notice. Demons are afraid of Jesus. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Don't you love that? Demons are afraid of Jesus. So many times we as Christians are afraid of demons. Why are we afraid if we are followers of Jesus, if we are covered in the righteousness of Christ, and therefore go in his authority and go in his name? How do you, in your prayers, in Jesus' name, amen. 
If that's the case, then guess what? We don't have to be afraid because the demons need to be afraid of us. Because we come in the name of Jesus. That's why Jesus said to Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. When you go in the name of Jesus, all right, the gates of hell, what do the gates do? Is a gate an offensive weapon? No. I mean, you could try to make it offensive, pick up a gate and try to hit someone, I guess. But it, no, it's a defensive mechanism, right? It's, it's, it's to keep out. So when Jesus prophesies, all right, because he's still living at the time that he says this to, to Peter, he says that the gates of hell won't be able to prevail against the church that goes out in my name. What he's saying is, 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 is demons will try to put up fences to protect their territory, and the gates of hell will not prevail. They can't. Amen. I mean, that's a promise that we have, that when we go in the name of Jesus into our community, into our towns, into our workplace, in the name of Jesus, the gates of hell can't prevail. We don't need to be afraid. The demons need to be afraid. Amen. They're certainly afraid of Jesus. And according to Jesus, they'll be afraid of Jesus' people when we go in his name. Number two, demons have a strong theology of Jesus. I love the irony here, as we're going to see in a little bit in this passage. The religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the ones that everyone looked to as the experts. Scribes, the scribes is going to be mentioned in a moment. They were literally considered the experts of the law. And these demons have better theology than them. <laughs> because the demons know who Jesus is. They spewed right theology right there. <laughs> Jesus, we know you are God. Religious leaders didn't know that. I'm going to take it a step further. I believe that demons have better theology than most of us, if not all of us. Because they live in the spirit world. It appears that they have access to where God dwells. They've been around him. We see the stories of Satan asking to sift out Peter like wheat, to do damage, to, or to, 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 to bring suffering to Job. Like, like, they have good theology. And that's not just like, uh, oh, that's, that's interesting. This is, has huge impl implications, and here's what I mean. Because they have great theology, one of the strategies of Satan and his demons is to just twi twist good theology, just enough, just enough to get us off the centrality of Christ. Just it's a little bit off from the true gospel. Not a lot. Just enough. And they know their theology well enough to do that. That's why it is foolish for any of us to think that 40 minutes with Tony <laughs> or whoever is up here teaching is enough for me. It is not. We have to know the word of God. Amen. Because the demons do. And they will twist it. And they will turn it ever so slightly. And then when they get you off there just a little, then they'll get you off there a little bit more. <laughs> and then they'll get you off there just a little bit more. And then just a little bit more. That's what Satan does. Scriptures say that he masquerades as light. Demons know their theology. Because of that, we sure better know ours. <laughs> and number three, I love this part. Demons are submissive to Jesus. Don't you love that when they ask permission for things? <laughs> I love that. He ordered them not to make him known. Now there's also, that, that opens up a lot of questions for me that like, 
if they're submissive to him, why does he give them a, a level of freedom to do some of the things they do? And again, I don't know. I'll find out in heaven, I guess. <laughs> so I can't, like the sovereignty of God and, and yet allowing them some free, you know, because they're created with a free will just like we were. Right? I mean, demons were good angels originally, right? I mean, so just a, a third of them fell in the rebellion with Satan. So they're created with free will. So in their free will, they chose the wrong side and will pay the price someday. So I don't understand how all that works, but, but I do understand this. That there is something very comforting to know that Jesus still has authority over even the demons. And he'll exhibit that full authority someday, but now he gives limited <laughs> freedoms of the demonic to do what they do. But they still, as we see here, still are submissive to him. Does this encourage you at all today? I hope it does. It encourages me. Look at verses 13 uh, through 15. It says, And he went up under the mountain and called to him, whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to what? Cast out demons. And then he names the twelve. And then you have something interesting in verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. You know, it's interesting. They, they, didn't even, they didn't even, his own family didn't even believe Jesus was the Son of God. And the stuff they were saying and the stuff he was doing, let me, let me just paraphrase. It weirded them out. Hey, don't apologize if your faith weirds people out a little bit. Because people that don't know Christ, they're living by flesh and blood alone. Don't apologize if the, weird, the world thinks you're weird. Now, don't be weird. That's on you if you're just a weird person. I, I can't help you on that. But, but in your beliefs and, and, and your narrow road living and people think you're weird and you're nuts about demons and this and that, do not apologize for that. We are not going to need to apologize to the world when Christ returns. So let's not apologize now. I don't weird something out like the first time you've ever talked about Jesus. Maybe don't go into demons and all that and all that right away, okay? But don't, be a, don't apologize for that. Even Jesus' own family were weirded out. But the, that's not my point today. But <laughs> notice he gave them the authority to cast out demons. And not just here, there's other places that beyond just the 12, where the 70 went out and he gave them authority as well to cast out demons and to do miracles, and so, really, I've given you, so here, here's kind of, I forgot to mention, I want to give you three truths about demons, and then three truths about Jesus. And really, it's three truths about demons about Jesus, and it's three truths about Jesus as it relates to Satan. But that seems really complicated. So, three things about demons, three things about Jesus. I gave you the three about demons, here's the three about Jesus. Number one, Jesus can give authority over demons to his followers. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, when Peter made that good confession, who do you say that I am? And you are indeed the Son of God. In that passage that I mentioned before, gates of hell can't prevail. He also said this to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There's authority that he passed on to Peter. There's authority that he passed on to those early disciples, not just the 12, but even the 70. And there were those who had those gifts of healing and miracles. Now, the great debate of today is whether that was given just in the transition from old covenant to new covenant. And when the completion of God's word was here, that those gifts were no longer needed. And that's, of course, a debate. And in this room, we have people that are on both sides of that. Okay? And my concern isn't to try to answer that one today and whether people can now cast out demons themselves, can people you know, um, um, uh, do exorcisms or those kind of things. I will only say this. The older I get, the more I realize how often I've put God in a box. Sometimes a theological box from my upbringing more than what Scripture actually may teach. 
So I want, I'll simply say this. I will never put God in a box. But the one thing I do know, he will never act in a way that's inconsistent with what his word has said, though. I've never cast out a demon in someone. I've prayed for healing. I've prayed if there's demonic influences. I've seen answered prayers. Does it happen? Can it happen? Maybe that'll be a question that gets answered later. But regardless of what side you land on, understand this though. This is true of any follower of Christ. If you go in the name of Jesus, whether it means casting out a demon in someone or this I do know. This I think we can land together on. When you go in the name of Jesus, you go in his authority. You go in his authority. And again, the gates of hell don't prevail. In my opinion, too often times we go in the authority of flesh and blood and we look and we live by sight, not by faith. We can do it as a church. We can do it as elder team and sit. Oh, I could never. Oh, I don't. We have to live by faith, not by sight. Anything that's going to last eternally is going to be God doing it. And I do believe that 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 I, I do believe people can be demon possessed. By the way, whether people have a gift of casting out demons, that's that's a whole other conversation we we can have. But but I believe that this can be a place where demons flee. I believe that. And that's not going to come just by human planning and let's do this thing, that church did that thing, that seemed to work good, let's do it. It comes when we live in the spiritual realm as a church and we're prayer warriors and we take prayer serious and we take worship serious and we take people who are messed up, screwed up, we take them serious because God loves them dearly. And it will never turn the doors. Hey, if someone came in with a demonic spirit, I would go over, lay hands on him, and say, in the name of Jesus, come out. Now, I don't know if I have that ability or not, but I know this. I know in the name of Jesus. This is my one concern in that world. (laughs) Is the emphasis can be on the person No person heals, God heals. No person casts out a demon, Jesus casts out a demon. But if someone came here and that was the case, I, I would go over and pray over them. And, I, and by the way, I wouldn't talk to Satan because it says in Jude that Moses didn't even talk to Satan. I would talk to the Father. And say, in the authority of your name, Father, cast this demon out. My point is, there's authority that every believer has. Look at verse 22 to 27. And the scribes, those were the experts of the law, who came from Jerusalem were saying, I mean, they're getting desperate by this point, okay? If you've been with us on a journey, this is not the first time Jesus has made them look really bad, you know? I mean, they're getting desperate now. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. And he caused them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? Some debate on Beelzebul and what does that mean and uh, technically Lord of the Flies and is that, it, it pro, uh, it could be a mis, you know, a, 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 an intentional, sp- oh, you didn't go down that road. But let's just, let me just summarize it. Uh, the, he's also, ultimately the scribes are saying it is, he, he is, he is, he is um, a son of Satan. And that's why he's doing this. And Jesus is like, so Satan's fighting against Satan? Like, what, what are you saying? Like, you know, um, he goes on, he says this. He, he says, um, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. 
And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, because, but is coming to an end. Let me just stop. Let me just paraphrase. Here's what Jesus is saying. You're idiots. Okay, that's the, my paraphrase. You're idiots. Why would I <laughs> be possessed by Satan, cast out demons out of people? I would be working against the very thing I do. But this is the part I want us to focus on. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. So this is a very interesting, very short parable that Jesus tells. The parable is this. A thief can't go in and rob someone who's bigger and stronger than him unless he figures out a way to subdue him. So whether he brings someone with him or he has a gun, you know, uh, you know what, like the, he's going to lose because the man who house he's trying to rob is bigger and stronger. And so he has to figure out a way to bind him so that he can then take his possession. Here's what's very interesting about this parable. Jesus is the thief in the parable. <laughs> Satan is the strong man with the possessions. The Bible says that Satan is the father of this world. There is for a season until Christ returns where Satan has a strong influence and power in this world. Jesus came while still God, but he came in the form of man. And it says that Satan, even though he came in the form of man, will be able to bind the strong man and take his possessions. Now, this is where it gets really cool. Guess what the possessions are? People. People. Satan has blinded people. In fact, we're going to look at it when we get to John, uh, Mark chapter 4, where it talks about the gospel being planted and, and Satan comes and, 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 and the story is as a bird takes the seed, takes him away. Like Satan is preventing many people from coming to know Jesus. And what this says is Jesus is, more, is, is able to Bind up Satan and free people from his bondage, their bondage to him. Jesus said, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not the son of Satan. I'm over Satan, you idiots. <laughs> I bind him up and I take what is mine because I was there at creation. In fact, you know who created Satan? Jesus. God. The next time you start getting nervous or afraid or remember, Jesus can bind the strong man, this Satan who has power, and free his people, his possessions, a people called by his name. Come on. Amen. Jesus can bind Satan for us. That's my point. Jesus can bind Satan for us. And the last thing I want to mention is this. It's not in this text, but I want us to look ahead. Jesus will bind Satan forever one day. Amen. Not only can Jesus bind people now, but let's be honest. There are people, right, that are still unbelievers, Many of them. All right, Jesus can 
bind Satan for us. But someday, when he returns, let me just give you a quick end of times, all right? In a real fast version that not everyone will agree because everyone, you know, different people have different opinions. So you've got your way and I've got the right way. Here it is. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I believe any moment the rapture can happen. Jesus can come today before we come home and usher us up into heaven, or at least what is a heaven at this point, all right? And up into heaven. And then seven years, tribulation period, seven years of hell on earth, where the Antichrist rises under the influence of Satan, the Antichrist and the false prophet, one world leader, and it'll be hell on earth for seven years. But many will come to know Christ, and many of the Jewish people will come to know Christ. Amen? Amen. That's why I take a look at what's going on over there. And I'm just saying, and, and, and all of these plans to rebuild the temple, because the temple will be rebuilt during the tribulation. And I would never say, I would never, ever tell you a date when Christ is returned. Because you know what that makes me? A false prophet. But I will tell you this, everything is certainly shaped up for the return of Christ. Now it may happen 10 million years from now because only God knows when he's going to return. But it sure is set up to happen. And he's going to return. And then seven year tribulation. And then us, the army of God, we're going to come back with him back to this earth. After those seven years. And here's what's going to happen in Revelation 20, verse 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended after that he must be released for a little while oh man Jesus is toying with Satan now he takes him and he throws him into the pit and he tells us ahead of time what he's going to do have you ever seen a boxer say I'm going to knock him out in the third round and then he knocks him out in the third round that's incredible He's like, I have always, I'm going to tell you ahead of time what's going to happen. I'm going to return with my people, and I'm going to whoop them, and then I'm going to bind them for a thousand years, and then I'm going to let him get out for a short time. And one last rebellion at the end of the thousand years, which is the millennium kingdom, heaven on earth. If the tribulation is hell on earth, the millennium is heaven on earth. Now, I want you to understand this. This is, always amazes me. In that passage, it talks about like, like more than like, like sand on the seashore. Do you realize even in a perfect like scenario on earth with Jesus reigning, still millions upon millions will still rebel? We, we, we think we can create here on earth now the kingdom. We can't. We can communicate the values of the kingdom we can proclaim the kingdom. We can live out the kingdom. We can pray for the kingdom to come. But even when the kingdom comes and a thousand years of Jesus reigning on earth, millions will still rebel because that's the power of the depravity of the human heart. That's why only the gospel saves. That's why you can't take an inch towards salvation. A righteous, even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags according to Isaiah. Even in the most utopia of places for a thousand years, people will still say, I don't want a bow to him. And then Satan, <laughs> I got out. He let you out. <laughs> He's toying with you. It's like a cat with a you know, I'm not comparing Jesus to a cat, you, but well, I guess I kind of, uh, you know, it's like the cat with a mouse, you know. <laughs> you know, it's almost like that though, right? Satan like, okay, oh, oh yeah, go ahead. Let me, let me get out again. And then this is what happens. After a thousand years, he's released. All these millions of people think they're going to join this rebellion with him. Look at verse 7 through 10. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison 
and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. All right, that's Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day day and night forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's how the story ends. The good guys win, the bad guys lose. And that's a permanent binding. All of eternity. Satan's not winning. Savior's toying with him. He's going to send him there. A thousand years. He's going to let him out one last time and then boom forever. Friends, that's the team you want to be on. That's who you want to follow. That's why I don't care if people think I'm a weirdo. Well, that might be for multiple reasons, but. (laughs) And that's why when people we know that we love die and it grieves our heart, there's somehow still joy in that grief. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about today. Because Jesus always wins. There is no ultimate defeat with Jesus. You and I will lose a few battles, but we win the war. Why? Because Satan has no authority with the people of God. Live in that freedom. Live in that joyfully this week. And don't be afraid to try hard things for God. To lean in. To share your faith. To take risks. Because we go in the name and authority of Jesus. Amen?